Hello, everyone, and welcome to today's event featuring Mary C. Daly, the President and CEO of the Federal Reserve Bank of San Francisco, and happy Tax Day. I just want to apologize in advance. I have a little bit of a cold, so I apologize. I'll try to not uh, uh, minimize the negative imp any imp negative impact for all of you from that, but I uh, just want to get that out. Um, and I hope re today being tax day, I hope there aren't any procrastinators among us out there, but I will admit that I was myself on the IRS site about two hours ago making sure to submit in time, and it was clogged up, but it finally worked. So in any case, I'm Mark Duggan, the Trioni Director of the Stanford Institute for Economic Policy Research, and I'm so glad that you're here with us today. Uh, and just a note before we get started that this event is being live streamed and recorded. I'm really thrilled that Mary Daly is here at CEPR as a return visitor. She was first with us five years ago, back in 2019, shortly after taking the helm of the San Francisco Federal Reserve Bank. She gave an excellent talk back then, and I know this is going to be a very informative and special hour with her here this afternoon. Instead of our usual format where our guest makes a formal presentation, Mary and I decided to instead have a pretty broad conversation, uh, sort of a fireside chat type thing, before opening things up to your questions. And given my slightly debilitated state, I might lean on all of you a little more than I otherwise would. So thank you in advance for uh, coming up with some great questions for uh, President Daly. Our hope is to cover a wide range of topic that Mary and her colleagues at the Fed are working on and thinking about and to have this experience very much tailored to the interests of our community here at CEPR. And I wanna give uh, Mary a very special thank you, not just for spending time with us here at this event this afternoon, but also for meeting with a group of about 30 Stanford students earlier today. A core part of our mission at CEPR is to create opportunities for up and coming economists, students, early career, faculty and scholars, and giving our students a chance to spend time with someone of President Daly's caliber is hopefully as inspiring as it is informative to those interested in pursuing economics. We are also deeply committed to connecting our roughly 120 faculty and their expertise with economic policymakers, and Mary's visit with us today is a prime example of how we try to build and maintain that bridge between the university and the policy world. So again, I'm really grateful that you're here with us today, Mar here with us today, Mary, and I know we're in for a real treat in the next hour. I'm look looking forward to hearing your perspective on a wide set of issues, including this country's strong economic growth and labor market, choppy recent inflation numbers, AI's impact on productivity, immigration's effect on the labor market, and so many other issues. But before we kick off our conversation, I think she's here somewhere. Uh, oh, there you are, okay, great. Uh, Mary, let me introduce you to everyone here. As president and CEO of the Federal Reserve Bank of San Francisco, Mary leads the largest and most diverse Federal Reserve District, home to one-fifth of the nation's population. I'm gonna give this a try. California, Oregon, Washington, Arizona, Nevada, Utah, Idaho, Alaska, Hawaii, Guam, American Samoa, Mm. Northern Marinara Islands, Mar Mariana Island. Anyway, I think I'm almost there. But it's a big, it's a lot of territory that she covers, that she's responsible for. Uh, and, and, and it is, uh, and I lost my, <laughs> home to one-fifth of the nation's population. She also sits on the Federal Open Market Committee to help set the Fed's monetary policy. Mary began leading the San Francisco Fed in October 2018, and had started working at the bank quite a bit earlier in 1996, first as an economist, specializing in labor market dynamics and economic inequality. She has since served as research advisor, vice president and head of macroeconomics, senior vice president and assistant director of research, and executive vice president and director of research. Through her speeches and talks like this one here today, she helps demystify key issues faced by monetary policymakers including topics such as inflation dynamics, financial stability, and the relationship between monetary policy and inequality. She is a research associate at the IZA Institute of Labor Economics and has held visiting research positions at the Congressional Budget Office, Cornell University School of Public Policy, and multiple universities and research institutes here in California. 
President Daly earned her PhD from Syracuse University, a master's degree from the University of Illinois at Urbana-Champaign, and a bachelor's degree from the University of Missouri, Kansas City. She also completed a National Institute of Aging postdoctoral fellowship at Northwestern University. With that, please join me in welcoming President Mary Daly to Seeper and get your questions ready. <laughs> okay, so uh, it's okay, Mary or President Daly? Mary's preferred. Okay, Mary, okay, great. I just Although you be... can call me President Dick Mary if you prefer. I mean, <laughs> President <laughs> Mary. <laughs> it's, uh, people have various uh, uh, Levels of comfort with what they address me right. as, and I'll, I'll take wanna, any of those. I don't want to make any mistakes. No, I'm just Mary's trying my fine. best up here. You're um, doing great, even okay. with a cold. Right, even with, okay. So, uh, so you lead, maybe you can just, we can, we're going to get into inflation, maybe R star and other stuff, but maybe you can just, at a high level, talk a little bit about what your job is like. And sure. as you come into work each day, I'm, I, it's amazing to me how big the area the San Francisco Fed covers, um, and just talk a bit about what, what it's like being the president of the San Francisco Fed and what a typical week or month looks like for you. Sure, and it's terrific being the president of the San Francisco Fed. I mean, it's a terrific honor to serve. We have a sign on the front of our lobby which says, our work serves every American and countless global citizens. It's a touchstone. I put that sign up the very first day I had the job as president and it embodies what we try to do, what we work towards every day. So how does that translate into a day-to-day -day activity for me? Well, my job is actually quite varied. When I first thought about becoming a president, I had watched other presidents before me have the role, including uh, one of my dear friends and mentors, uh, Janet Yellen, who is now the Treasury Secretary. So she's had a lot of uh, things which I can model. But seriously, which I asked her one day, what do you like about being president? And she said, you have so many different things to do. Any day is different from the last day, but here's the things that you do, and this is, what, this is actually how my day looks. On any given day, I spend a day like I did today, where I, got, I came here, I met with students, I met with professors at Stanford, I met with the Latino Action Business Network and learned about what the challenges of running Latino businesses are, how they are challenged to scale. Uh, had an opportunity to come here and do this fireside chat with members of the community and think carefully about how we do our policy and how it affects people. So that's a given day. It, that we would call that a day of public engagement. On any other given day, I'm reading research papers and talking to research teams and business leaders and market participants about and the Shadow Open Market Committee, of which there are a couple of members here who are talking to me about, how do you think about making monetary policy from an academic and modeling perspective? Sometimes I'm working on leadership issues about not just the Federal Reserve Bank of San Francisco, where we have roughly 2,000 employees, but also the whole Federal Reserve System, because Congress gave us three responsibilities that we all have to collaborate on. One is monetary policy, which you all know, dual mandate, price stability, full employment. That's a big part of my role. But we have other two other mandates, including a safe and sound payment system and a safe and sound financial system working in collaboration with the OCC and the FDIC. And so all of those things together mean that um, we, we have to work collaboratively but also proactively to think forward about what could affect the economy and what could affect any of those mandates. Any given day, I'm doing those types of things. And one of the reasons, uh, we released my schedule publicly, but one reason is to help people feel transparent about what, what I'm actually doing. And what people notice who have looked at that schedule is, I'm as likely to be me meeting with a business leader as uh, business leaders, as worker groups like unions, as community groups, as you know leaders of industry, et cetera. And all of that is important to how we do our job well. So I have a three-legged stool of making policy. Uh, the data and the analytics and, the, and the, the empirical work, the models, and the engagement we have with all the participants in the economy. So we put those three legs together and we can craft the policy that actually fits the, the needs of what we're trying to accomplish. Wow, well, sounds, sounds busy. Oh, I'm busy. But you don't have to do email? I get over 300 and something emails a, a day. So if you email me and I'm slow to respond, it's because I can't find you in the sea of emails. So it's best to text me. OK, that's good to know. All right, well, let's get into something that's a little more, even a little 
you know, in the news a fair amount lately. So I just recently wrapped up teaching Ecom 1 and I talk about the, in, in the class, I'm not a macro person, but I try to do justice to these topics like inflation and unemployment and so forth. And you know, the fact that we get monthly inflation updates and we had a recent update to monthly inflation numbers, which wasn't kind of what people were expecting slash hoping for. So can you talk a bit about how that influence your thinking and just, it's one data point, but maybe you can talk a little bit about how that, how you're thinking about 2024. Sure, so the most important thing about any particular data release is to remind ourselves that any particular data release is filled with potential signal and potential noise, and we have to be able to think through it. The way I characterize that is we as a Fed and, and any of the work that we do is not data point dependent, it's data dependent, and data is a plural word. And so we're looking at the, you know, whether you call it a dashboard or the preponderance of evidence or just the, the full slate of information, it is these are pieces of information coming in that help us project where we're going to be heading. And the important thing is that projection of where we're going to be heading, because if we, we can't make policy for whatever's just come in, that's a backward looking number. We have to think about how that number influences what the most likely path is going forward. Now for me, when you said that we were surprised by the inflation data, I think it's not as surprising to, to me as, as it might have been to some, is that inflation was always going to be a bumpy ride. There's no time in history where inflation just you know, comes down without bumps along the way. So having bumps along the way is not particularly surprising. And one of the things that I really reflect back on is look at 2023. The early part of 2023, it was very sticky inflation. It was mostly flat. And particularly the what we call super core, which is the core inflation absent housing or taking housing out, which was is the service industry, that was particularly flat. But then in the second half of the year, inflation fell rapidly. So we have to be thoughtful about not getting too confident that the latest sticky inflation is an indication of where we're going forward. And we can't get too confident that our projection that inflation will gradually continue to come down is, is, is going to materialize. And it's one of the reasons you hear Fed officials and myself talking about data dependence. It's really, you know how you're gonna to react to the economy, but then you have to see what the economy is bringing to know what that reaction should be. And uh, since one might think, well, doesn't that mean you're always behind? I would answer no, it means that we meet uncertainty with a good deal of um, awareness that getting ahead, too far ahead on either thing would end up with a policy response that either was too strong or too weak. And the worst thing we can do right now is act urgently when urgency isn't necessary. You know, the policy's in a good place. We're in the ready position. We can respond as the economy evolves. The labor market's not and giving us any indication it's faltering and inflation is still above our target and we need to be confident it is on path to come down to our target before we would feel the need and I would feel the need to react. Right. I mean, to some extent, looking at the monthly jobs reports, it's been kind of incredible to me that they It has been incredible. Be like another 300,000 or 280 or whatever. I mean, it's, it's been really, really strong. So sometimes I see those jobs numbers and I think, why is anyone talking about cutting rates anytime soon? So thoughts on, on, on that? Well, I think that, you know, the idea that, you know, I think of inflation as the impartial judge in all of this, because one of the things that is true is that the labor market has surprised us over time. I came to work at the Fed in 1996, and one of the early tasks I had was answering question for Chairman Greenspan's t staff about why the labor market was able to grow so fast and not spur inflation. He was talking about the marginally, for those who go back as far as that, he was talking about marginally attached workers and looking at other places where we might get workers coming in because the economy was strong. Um, remember we had welfare reform at that time, which put a lot of single mothers back in the labor force. He was looking for opportunities for that to be allowing us to grow faster than the speed limit was written down. And then of course we had the productivity boom, which also increased the speed limit. So that's part of what we have to consider. But of, but of course, you can't just be optimistic and say, well, the speed limit's higher, so let's just go for it, and 300's no problem. You have to be thoughtful, and ultimately, inflation is the impartial judge. And, and by that, I mean inflation will tell us 
whether we are running beyond our sustainable pace. If supply and demand are out of balance, we'll see it in prices. And we can't just look at the published information because again, that's telling us what just happened. We have to ask businesses, are you raising prices? What's the frequency and magnitude of your price changes? Are you passing through? And do you think you have per pricing power? Are, are workers asking for wage increases? Are they asking for them beyond the, what you think is their productivity gains? All of these things are part of why we do public engagement. I get asked a lot, why do you do so much public engagement? And it's really because that helps us be forward looking and ask where's the economy heading, not just where it's been. And so, yeah, I look at the jobs report and I say, wow, that is um, very strong. And with inflation printing as high as it is, there is no urgency to cut rates. So if you'll notice, uh, I spend and have spent, and other Fed officials spend a lot less time talking about rate cuts than yeah. uh, the media does. Right. And one right. of the reasons is because the economy is growing at a solid clip, uh, the labor market's strong, and inflation is still printing higher than target. It's interesting because I got asked recently by a journalist about my thoughts on why it is the case that the U.S. economic performance has been so much stronger, let's say, than in Europe or in many other industrialized countries. And I was just in the UK and France last month. And I can tell you, like three hour lunches and really enjoyable times. They, maybe they have the better work-life balance, but it is, it's, it's different. Their economy <laughs> is, uh, is somewhat different. Do you, I don't know if you have a sense of, uh, from, from that perspective, looking at us in a, in a global perspective, the US versus other industrialized countries. Is it, you know, we here in Silicon Valley, we heard last month from the CEO of NVIDIA, which is a company that's just, you know, sort of in your district has just exploded in terms of its opportunity and so forth. But I don't know if, you, if, if your thoughts on uh, what, it, what makes the US special. You know, it's really hard to put a, a point on that right now. We did come out of the pandemic very strong. There was a lot of support offered to the economy. And if you think about the support that the US economy got relative to other countries, you know, we had uh, every, all countries put in monetary policy support, lowered the interest rate, um, often did balance sheet policies, forward guidance to, to support during the pandemic. We also had a lot of fiscal support that was added, which was different than some of our industrialized counterparts. And many researchers have said that was part of why we were able to recover on the demand side although that demand recovery outstripped our available supply and so it also contributed to to some extent the inflation all you know but the thing that i think you know benchmarks that a little bit is inflation's risen in all the countries not just in the US so it's not simply a reaction to um, that kind of support you know i was in right before the um, the year turned right before in the last part of 2023 i was in frankfurt at a conference and in the UK and I had meetings with policymakers and others, economists and, 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 and businesses. And what I, what I learned is they keep saying, well, what is the US doing? Because we would like to do it. Um, because we, are, we have good growth, we have a solid labor market, we don't have that constant fear of recession at this point now, most uh, people are less afraid of recession and we've sort of shifted the whole conversation from, is it gonna be a recession? or is it going to be uh, no landing? So there's always that soft landing in the middle, but it was recession or soft landing, now it's soft landing or no landing. And it is that conversation that our European counterparts wondered um, why they, they aren't having. And there's a real consensus there among the people, it seems, that the economy's not delivering the outcomes it wants. But I would offer that's similar, if you look at the published data, you are really, you, you feel good about the U.S. economy and our progress on inflation, while we're not there yet, has been very uh, good. It's been significant, but we're still not there yet. But the growth has been something quite remarkable. The, the question is, why do we have a vibe session, as some like to call it? Why do consumers and, and survey participants feel like they're a little more pessimistic than the data might say? And I think the same is true whether you're in the European nations or the U.S., there is a difference between the inflation rate falling and the price level being high. And right now, we had a big run up in prices and inflation's coming down, but 2% on a higher base really doesn't feel the same as 2% on a lower base. And ultimately, when I go into communities or businesses, they say I'm paying twice as much for X 
and now it's rising at over, you know, almost 3%, between 2 and 3%. And that seems worse than when it was a lower base and rising less. Right. And I, I think that ultimately explains a lot about um, why in the U.S. we have a vibe session, and in Europe, why they're still not completely confident that they're going to get out of this without some upheaval uh, in terms of a of labor market outcome and things. But I, the U.S. is in a better place. There's no doubt about it. Um, I always hate to describe, describe it to our ingenuity and fortitude, so I'll just keep it with, I think people had a really, they were hungry to get back after the pandemic, and they're, they're spending and working like you haven't, no one expected. If I were had been there, I would have said that they need to get in and out and subway so people can get their lunch in 20 minutes and get back to work and not have to spend <laughs> three hours getting lunch. Every uh, he had an efficiency but it was on enjoyable, the lunch. but it just, anyway. They but made it, me, you get better treatment than I do. When I was there, I had to eat my lunch during the business meeting, so they keep me wow, working, you know. Okay, yeah, no, I get well, a high rate of return out of public person. service. <laughs> there's, there's time is money. It is, uh, well, let, maybe you can talk a little bit. I'm going to get to a question about our star, but before getting oh, there. Oh, our star, wow. We are going is, full board. Yeah, we're going to go get, get into the I should nuts have and my bolts of monetary policy. <laughs> <laughs> but maybe you can talk a little bit. I mean, one thing that is very different in the U.S. economy now than the last time you were here is the interest rates being mm -hmm. much higher, and that is affecting consumers through, uh, through uh, vehicle loans, through credit card loans, through mortgages and, and, and so forth. So can you talk a little bit about how you're thinking about the interest rates? Because you know, some have said that inflation doesn't necessarily incorporate that, that real cost to consumers and your thoughts on that. Well, I mean, ultimately, and this is just a reality of central banking, and especially central banking in the United States. So we have congressionally given two mandates, full employment and price stability. And we have one tool, the interest rate. Now we have other tactical ways we can accomplish accommodative or, or stricter policy through the balance sheet and forward guidance, but you can really think of it as we have one tool and two goals. So it is absolutely the case that when inflation rose and was persistently high, then we have to raise the interest rate to combat high inflation. And ultimately, when you raise the interest rate, right. it filters into car loan rates, mortgage interest rates. You see it almost immediately in mortgage interest rates, and in fact, it was it's, a, it's just a great reminder of how this all works. In November of 22, we start raising rates in 20, well, I, I'd say I lose track of the years, but right before we late raised interest rates for the first time, we said we were going to begin raising interest rates. And in that November, the mortgage interest rate rose and refinancing completely stopped in the next couple of weeks. And then, of course, the, that filters into home price appreciation, et cetera. So even with just the acknowledgement that interest rates were going to go up, you saw that immediate effect. That, of course, influences borrowing costs. It raises borrowing costs. And individuals say, well, now it's going to be more costly for me to buy a home. And I say, it is. And I was just up in Portland, Oregon, giving a, a talk on housing at a, at a national conference for community development. And that was a critical issue there is, how is the Fed's raising interest rate helping the housing market? And, I, and my answer is the same. The housing market is high for two reasons. One, I mean, housing, price, housing costs are high for people for two reasons. One is the mortgage interest rate's high, and that affects, of course, building and um, purchases if you want to buy a home. And, but raising interest rates to get inflation down is a temporary situation. As inflation comes down, we will be able to normalize the interest rate. But housing prices were also high because there's a very large imbalance between the supply of housing and the demand for housing. And when we had rapidly rising inflation, at like at the 7% level, that was affecting uh, home purchasing material, home buying, uh, for instance, it was affecting um, construction materials. They were rising rapidly. You couldn't get them. Remember that people couldn't build or finish homes. You couldn't remodel homes. And so that was also not working for uh, Americans. So this is a remedy to get the inflation down, but we will be left with something the Fed cannot control, which is, or doesn't have a lever to, to pull, which is we still have a large imbalance between supply of housing and demand of housing. And that's not simply a Bay Area problem. That's across the country. And in, in preparation for this housing talk I gave in Portland, I was 
looking at survey evidence from across the country, and I found a survey done by the Cato Institute, and it found that 87% of Americans, when asked, said that they are worried about housing, the cost of housing. And that was true across demographic groups, um, age, income, whatever state you're in, geography, rural, urban. There was no group in, in the United States that they, who they surveyed that wasn't worried about housing and the cost of it. And that just speaks to you less, and it's been going on for a while, and that's more about the in balance between supply and demand. We will, you know, working hard to do our part. I am working hard to do our my part in terms of bridling inflation and bringing it back to 2%, but it won't solve the broader problem we have that we need more housing. Right. right. That is especially true, well, this depends, I'm not a housing economist, but it seems like that is very true here in California. I don't There's think you area. have to be a housing economist <laughs> right. to know that we have uh, problems we in have the Bay Area in California right. in That's housing. Right. Okay, uh, so one key factor for monetary policy is R star, and uh, the so-called neutral or natural rate of interest. And some economists have argued that it, is, that it changed as a result of the pandemic. And what are your views on R star and its potential implications for monetary policy going forward? Well, earlier today in a meeting we had, I had with faculty, which was fantastic, um, John Taylor asked the question, what should we be studying? What do you think about? And I said, the two things that I think we really need to study that we need more of, and love the research community to help, because as a Fed official, what do I need to know more about? There are two things, really. What is the, the long-run neutral rate of interest? So if you came prior to the pandemic, the neutral rate of interest had been coming down, and most countries were writing down a very low neutral rate, around 0.5 for the US was the number. And that was combined with um, the sense that we were consistently across the globe going to be fighting inflation from below our target, that inflation was going to fall short of 2% or whatever the target was in a particular country, and central banks were going to need to be pushing up inflation to get to target so that we didn't end up in the proverbial um, Japan situation where you had deflation. So that was prior to the pandemic. With the pandemic, there was a lot of disruption to global supply chains and productivity and, and other things have been thinking they, they might change, the, the demographic, the aging of the population still going on, but the bulk of it that might have changed the savings equation might have changed. Those are all factors that people are offering and saying perhaps the neutral rate of interest has risen and perhaps we'll be fighting our inflation, fighting inflation as a central bank from above our target, coming back to something we're, we're more familiar with if you look at our whole history since 1913. That's not a question anyone knows the answer to. So you do hear people saying, oh, it's risen, and you do hear people say, no, it hasn't, but we actually don't know the answer to that. So from a policymaker perspective, how I approach it is the star variables, as we call them, are very hard to measure. There's R star and there's U star, the natural rate of unemployment. The only one we have any certainty about is pi star, which is the inflation target, because we make it. We said it was two, and we know it's two. But we don't know what the natural rate of unemployment is, really. It's not a truth variable. It's an estimated um, idea variable. And R star is the same. So I, would, I think that that's a really open field of research for my own sense. I, I completely take in the idea that it might have changed. We can't put 0.5 down and assume 0.5 is right. We have to, so just, and I've said this publicly before, this won't be news, but I think it's information, is I look at all the estimates done by researchers. And, and by the way, you can look at estimates that, you can look at 15 models, and you can find answers that are negative, and you can find answers that are 11%. So that's the range of estimates that models will give because we don't have a perfect way to estimate R star. You, you sort of experientially learn where it is within a range. For my own thinking, I think having something going in that's between 0.5 and 1, which is where a big number of the estimates sit, is a reasonable thing to think about. But as a policymaker, and that was true with the labor market, it's when we talk about 300,000, you know, our estimate of the study state um, level of, or the normal weight we should be if we're in balance is 100,000. Well, and we're getting 300,000. That says, oh my gosh, we're 200,000 a month over at least. Well, I, again, we have to learn experientially, and in those worlds, um, the inflation rate is the impartial judge. On our star, it's if you think it's lower than it is, you'll see it in the economy. 
and you'll see it persistently, and then we'll be able to adjust the policy rate to accommodate that. Okay, great. All right, that's super interesting, and I wish I were taking notes, although we're videoing it for the next time I teach Ecom. Now with generative really AI, you can transcribe. Well, you could have done that with other things. <laughs> you can do that with the transcription service. That, but I'm glad that you mentioned AI, so here we are in at Stanford, and it's hard to walk 15 feet on this campus without someone talking about AI. So many people are excited about the potential productivity increment mm -hmm. that AI could generate, but also concerns about distributional consequences and so forth. Can you talk a little bit about your thoughts on AI and its impact on the economy? Absolutely. So. You know, when I think about AI, I always go back to how we think about technologies in general. And you have to look over the whole history. You can go back to any general purpose technology, which is what some offer AI is like. Um, that would be the steam engine, electrification, et cetera. Or you can go back to computerization, which is, you know, a, a different kind of technology, but still something that boosted productivity and led to distributional consequences, as you know. So when I think of, when I look at technologies over time, we know one fact for sure. Technology on net has never reduced jobs. It's always added, it's always added to employment. But the, the next piece of that sentence is also critical. So it never reduced jobs on net. But the timing between when the jobs are replaced, when they're augmented, and when they're created can be distant. And the people who are affected by the replacement may be different than the people with the augmentation or the creation. And that's where these gaps form when you get distributional consequences. And I don't think that we should believe without work that generative AI is different than that. Generative AI is especially, but AI more, gener more uh, generally across all the AI parts, whether it's machine learning or generative AI and all the things in between, they have the capacity to make life better for many people. And uh, I, you know, following uh, David Otter's th th thought process, and I think about it this way too, not because it's just the theory tells us that, or you can sort that out, but because we talk to businesses. And what we learn from businesses is first of all, they're not doing the normal replace, then down the road augment, and then down the road create. They're doing those things together. So they're, because they're really thinking about this from a skills perspective and a tasks perspective. So I, had, I have round tables regularly from different groups and small, medium, and large businesses. What I'm hearing a lot from small and medium businesses is this, that we are testing these tools, often experimenting before we go to product, production, and we're using lower risk activities, ones that their back office operations, we have a lot of auditing going on, we're trying to see if it's going to be useful for us. But let me give you an example of one that I think is really, it kind of helps, helped me understand. So we have a business that is, um, has a, it's a big retail outlet, and they do their own brand, and then they also have other brands, and they have a big retail outlet. They have over 150,000 items for which you need a SKU, and you need a description because they have a big online presence. And even in your store, you need, a, you need a description. So all the items they have aren't fascinating to write about. Sometimes it's a screw that replaces a previous screw for a part you bought that, that the screw fell out. So that's not all that interesting to write about, but it still has to be written about. And then there's really cool stuff that's sold, which has high margin, right, and is more fun to write about. So they have a copy editing staff and copywriting staff that writes these descriptions, but they're using generative AI with the copywriters to produce first drafts of all these SKUs and then auditing to say, okay, did the screw get the right description? If it did, fantastic. Those screws can now get the Gen AI product with auditors, and my copywriters, copy editors, can now be writing about the very high margin items that are more fun to write about. Oh, and importantly, my copywriters can now work with the sales and marketing teams to write descriptions that make our products more interesting. So we asked this person, you know, point blank, are you replacing, augmenting, or creating on net, probably creating, for the time being, no net reduction in headcount, but definitely a change in tasks and the kinds of people hiring. So replacing some of the skills, so probably not going to hire as many copywriters down the road because we don't need to get the 150,000 done by just that human team, 
but definitely expanding the interesting tasks that the copywriting teams get to do and having to hire prompt engineers to try to train the models for the instances used and then having wanting to hire, not having to, but wanting to hire uh, strategists who know how to use Gen AI can look at all the other products that are product areas where they could have business process improvement. And I think of that as different than the past. And so then you ask, so my main talking point with generative AI is how it looks down five years down the road, 10 years down the road in terms of has it had unwanted distributional consequences or had harming effects on, on uh, privacy? That's completely up to us. Technologies don't make those decisions. Technologies are just tools. People make those decisions. And we have something that's really powerful, potentially productivity enhancing, but it's going to depend on how we use it, what the guardrails around its use are. Firms are already using it. People are already using it. Uh, if you're a geeky tech person, a little bit like me, I would say that uh, when ChatGPT was launched in November of 2022, uh, it uh, natural language models, uh, generative AI had its eternal September moment. And if you know, don't know what eternal September is, it was when AOL email, you know, mailed out the floppy disks for all Americans to get on the internet. And everybody who was on the internet said, where did all these people come from and why are they asking these questions? So before it had kind of been the parlance of an academic world, and why did it come in September? Because every September, uh, new students would come to universities and get on the internet, but then all of America got on the internet. So I think that ChatGPT being launched, and you could get it on your phone, has left consumers and workers able to use things that they are bringing into the workplace, and now businesses are trying to harness and leverage that as fast as they can. That's great. Okay, so I'm going to have a couple more questions for Mary, and then I'm going to open it I'm up. I'm going to drink out of my oh. goblet of wine. I know. It's pretty nice. It is. I don't think it's wine. Oh, it's not <laughs> wine. You're right. Water. I'm sorry. I meant water. Yeah, yes. Uh, um, Maybe they, maybe they spiked yours with something. In no, they didn't. It's just okay. water. I'm just being very clear. <laughs> Plus, this is like a week's worth for me if it was wine. <laughs> As a Syracuse alum, I really want to ask you about Stanford's upcoming move to the ACC and the consequences. But we don't have time for that. So we're going to get on to immigration. So we've gotten over the years. We so went from times, football to the. You never know. I mean, it's I'm just, a it, huge I'm just, sports fan. I never so. quite know what I'm going to do <laughs> out here. So. Uh, we've gotten boost to the labor market from immigration. But it, immigration is highly uncertain, and it varies for many reasons, including politics and policies that get implemented. And additionally, labor force participation varies a lot for reasons that have to do with lots of factors, including what government policy is, what fiscal policy is, the tax code, safety net programs, and so forth. Those are highly uncertain, constantly moving variables. Can you talk a little bit about how you think about those in the context of how, how that influences your thinking about monetary policy. Sure. So I start with the idea of, um, back to that thing we started with, with the speed limit. So how fast can the economy grow? How fast can the labor market grow? How many jobs per month can we add without spurring inflation? And if you look back last year, the labor market remained robust and continued to add jobs that were outpacing the estimated number by any forecaster about how many jobs we could add each month without spurring wage inflation and ultimately price inflation. Well, when you look back at 23, you recognize pretty quickly that that was in part because the labor force grew faster than most everybody had projected. That faster growth was related to two things. Increase in domestic labor force participation, so more people participated than were assumed to participate. Because remember, we have that tsunami of the aging of the baby boom coming through, and that should pull participation rates down. But they were flat and up for prime age workers, those between 25 and 54, which I uh, don't enjoy the characterization of prime age as much as I did when I was in that age range. But um, there it is. Hanging on that's what, we call, that's what we call it. So that's how I, I was trained to call it. So that's what <coughs> I call it. But if you, think about, um, if you think about that, that was a positive supply shock. That was a positive boost to labor supply. We also had a very positive boost to labor supply from immigration flows that came into the country that were not anticipated. So that helped us grow, the labor market grow fast, expand quickly without spurring wage inflation. And as you remember from last year, probably uh, wage and price inflation both slowed. So the question is, is that going to continue? And there I think it's quite uncertain. Um, if you look at the numbers on labor force participation, we have reachieved 
our pre-pandemic levels in some ways surpassed them. Now a strong economy, in addition to all the things you named, a strong economy is one of the features that brings new labor markets in or re-entrants in. Right? If there's a strong economy, people come back. If you think back to the pandemic, we were talking about the, these individuals would never come back. They were gonna be afraid to come back to the labor force. There was the great resignation. People were just gonna live forever off doing, I don't know what, but they were gonna do this. And of course, none of that materialized because the labor market got kept being strong. Uh, people got through that pandemic phase, health improved, um, opportunities improved, and people came back. How much more do we have in there? It really depends on how much we can exceed what we have historically seen in labor force participation. It could be that retirees return. That's possible, but I, can't, I don't think we should count on that. Prime age participation, that 24 to 54, uh, 25 to 54, it would have to go up beyond what we've been seeing in the last couple of decades or more, and that's hard to get to. And then on the immigration, that is really affected by policies on the border, by um, the labor market. So it's policies at the border, but if our economy slows and there are fewer opportunities, it isn't as worthwhile for people to cross the border and, and work in the labor market from another country. So there's just all these factors that make a big uncertainty on that. So I have taken some signal in my own projection for labor force that we have a little more room to, to expand the labor market, but I don't have, I haven't taken the full signal. The Congressional Budget Office said, well, let's just, you know, they had a thing where they, you, I'm sure you saw, um, that they extrapolated and said, here's our projected immigration flows. And that's a reasonable projection, but as a monetary policymaker, I cannot incorporate, I don't feel like I can safely incorporate that into my baseline. That is a upside risk to supply, which would be welcomed uh, to have increased supply in labor force however it comes, it could come through domestic participation, but it is not something that um, I can count on when I'm making policy because it would end up in that state that we, I talked about we do not want, where inflation gets stuck at a high level. And given the toxicity on the economy that that has, it's something I'm unwilling to, to take in uh, fully until I see it materialize. Great, okay, thank you for that. So let's turn a little bit, I know this is a session about monetary policy, but I'd love to hear- It can just, be a session about anything because you're the boss. I don't know, <laughs> not sure. Uh, I don't have 2,000 people working for me. I don't know how you do I, I've got 30 working for me and I'm tired, so you've got a lot of energy. It's impressive. I've got a lot of help too. I mean, you don't run an institution like the Fed without a lot of people working on behalf of the same thing. You know, So we have all those things I named. There are people working in those groups, but there's also people leading those groups. And, right. and right. I benefit from uh, all of the people who work with me side by side. And you've been there 28 years. Why do we do this? I mean, why? <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. I, it's okay. You're younger than me, so you feel like that's still okay. That's but it's not. You're going to get to an age where you're going to say, why are we counting? Yeah. And I told you I'm a sports fan, so when Peyton Manning was told how many, he used to be the <laughs> Indianapolis Colts quarterback, um, but for most of his career he was said, wow, you've played X number of games. And he looked at the commentator and he said, why do you do that? <laughs> Every day I tell myself I'm not old. And then you pop out with, yeah, I am. I mean, why? Okay, but I okay. have worked at the Fed for a considerable number of years, all of them wonderful. Yes, okay, wonderful. Uh, so I'm just curious uh, what you think of uh, the United States' current fiscal trajectory. So I've worked there long enough to, so let me, I should start, let me, before I give you the answer I was going to give you, let me remind everyone here that monetary policy and fiscal policy are completely different things. And fiscal policy is made by our elected officials. Um, we elect them as citizens and they are the people making those allocated decisions. So the Fed plays no role in, in those types of things and we have no tools. So I wanna make sure that I'm stating that clearly. But what we do know, and I can say this as an economist, and we have a long history of um, the Federal Reserve saying when, when it thinks we're on an unsustainable path, and I just think this isn't coming from the Fed. Anyone looking at our budget and our, our debt can say that this is probably an unsustainable path for our economy, and that at some point there will be uh, a rebalancing. And the, the thing that I feel concerned about is not about being a Fed official. It's really about being a person who met with those young people today, those students. And I'm asking myself, 
how are we, if we don't manage our budget, we give the debt, accumulated debt, to the next generation, and they have less to work with. And so that hasn't changed in a long time. Chairman Greenspan said that, uh, Chairman Bernanke, uh, Chair Yellen, and just recently, uh, Chair, Chair Powell, when he was in San Francisco, said that to Kai Rizdahl's question. I don't know if you ask him that same question here at Stanford, but it is a, a normal question. It has nothing to do with being at the Fed. It has everything to do, to do with looking at the economy and asking, how do we sustain the, the spending we have against the population we have and the productivity we have and the growth we have? Okay, one more question for me, because we are, I want to just ask you about California's economy. Okay because California is the biggest state in your portfolio, uh, and we are here in California, and we have launched recently at CEPR, the California Policy Research Initiative, so we're trying to be helpful to state and local policymakers here in California. So um, right now, if you look, though, at economic indicators, California is doing spectacularly well in some respects, but also is struggling in some other respects. So if you look, as of last month, we have, for example, the nation's highest unemployment rate, um, and we've had you know, some troubling numbers on various measures of inequality, mm -hmm. depending on how you, how you look at them. But at the same time, we also have some of the world's leading technology companies here. Um, and so in certain respects, I think the state is in a really enviable position to have these fantastic companies located here. But what, what do you think explains this apparent discrepancy in our state? Well, as you said, I have been in, I've been in California since 1996, and one of the first tasks I had was to, as an economist working at the Fed, was to try to explain why when California had all the tech companies, all the ones supporting the computer revolution and computerization and the, ultimately the dot-coms, why there was growing inequality, why there were people who weren't able to take advantage of that, and why, if you can go back in that time, you remember housing prices were, were I couldn't even live in San Francisco. I couldn't afford it. I was in, I, had, I moved first to Oakland, California. I've been there ever since. But be, the reason I did is because California, San Francisco was completely unaffordable because people with larger salaries and more rapid growth were getting in their salaries, were getting those places. And it hasn't really, the, the levels, the, cha the challenges really haven't changed. This, the levels fluctuate over the business cycle, and now we have the same challenges you're seeing, and the pandemic didn't make that better, it made it worse. I mean, the pandemic showed us, it was always there, but it showed us an economy of haves and have-nots. The haves were defined as anyone who could work from home and still make their money, make a living, because companies weren't going out of business, they were, they were employing you, you just were doing it at home. And then all the people who either lost their opportunities in the, in the labor market, were laid off or let go, businesses closed, or those who had to come in and find that they were taking, you know, would it at the time seem like very large health risks and were large health risks while they were trying to do these things. That has persisted, and so now we find ourselves with the high inflation really being a challenging thing because if you're um, able to generate income and you're able to, you know, continue to earn and you're making a high wage, pay, you know, working for some of the, the, the really robust companies in, our, in the state, well then you're able to not, you're not happy about inflation, but you have a way to insulate yourself from the worst effects. Inflation is the, is the thing that affects those least able to bear it most. And for that group of individuals, they have, of course, a robust labor market, but not always in a way that, re, that translates into a robust uh, growth in their well-being because inflation's chewing it away. So I think these are the same challenges we have and what explains the discrepancy is often what explains the discrepancy in my judgment. The, the jobs we have that are being created are not always matching the skills of the individuals who could take part in them. And then of course the more rapid growth in the economy we have isn't being matched with increased housing. And if you, take, if you make housing very expensive and you don't have the skills to partake in the more um, valuable jobs in terms of wages, then you're going to end up with a recipe where good growth brings inequality. And you know, California has been dealing with those issues for a while. What's different now than I've seen before is that California and the coastal states are not the only ones dealing with this. Now I see that in Idaho, in Utah, in Arizona, even in Nevada, that there are these, these divides that are forming that look very much like what California looked like when I first came in 1996, that you know, Boise, Idaho is one of the fastest growing cities in the country, 
and house prices are now so high that the people who grew up in Boise, Idaho can't afford them. And it's, it's, a, good, it's a booming economy. If you go there, you're, everywhere they have opportunities, but the people who had lived there the whole time don't really feel like they're partaking in those opportunities. And so it's a, it's a more general question than just in California on the unemployment rate. I mean, one thing that I also learned is that the unemployment rate is high in different states. Uh, Nevada has a similarly high one. Utah is one of the lowest ones in the nation. And ultimately, it has a lot to do with the age of the population and the amount of churn in the labor market. A very active and dynamic labor market has more churn. And the more churn you have, the higher the unemployment rate is. So it doesn't mean that we shouldn't use the metric. It just means that the way I've learned to look at it is you take the unemployment rate in any given period in any given state and compare it to the average unemployment rate in that state over time. And there, you know, California looks very similar to other states in the nation, which is the, the unemployment gap is falling as the economy is strengthening. But it doesn't leave people necessarily with the same level of returns. Okay, so let's take at least a few questions from the audience. I feel bad because I so enjoy asking you questions. I took way more time than I should have. But in any case, let me start right here. David and then Ken. David right here in the front row. You did pretty well for a cold. I don't know. I, yeah, you just, you energized me, Mary. It was great. Yeah. Uh, first of all, thank you for being here, Mary. So um, I want to know if you or any specific group at the Fed or any of the F Fed uh, banks do some scenario planning for potential shocks to the economy, which could be very, very difficult to deal with. For example, it's not hard to imagine today that the U.S. could be involved in a major war. Um, and what that might mean both, you know, there might be some significant uh, defense increase spending, but also the, the markets probably aren't going to react well to that. And kind of how you're seeing how, what, what do you think monetary policy might look like in, to deal with that short term? So, you know, one of the things that we do on a regular basis is um, that we have these, you know, large research teams. Um, they're often not as big as they are valuable, um, but they, we have valuable <coughs> research teams both at the Board of Governors and in every reserve bank. And those research teams, and you have the research being done, whether it's in supervision and financial markets or the payment system or for economic research related to monetary policy. And these research teams are tasked with studying the economy we have, but doing scenario planning for the economy we could have. What if a shock occurs? But one of the things we have, there's so many possible things that could occur, and you don't want to spend your time doing everything. So when you're thinking about scenarios, you're really focused on what are the ones that are have some likelihood of occurring and have the biggest risk to the US economy. And so definitely um, the pandemic was not one we had modeled, but it's one we could throw our whole energy behind and say, okay, what happens if it continues to go? What happens if it resolves quickly? And so that work was done. We regularly model ones with, what if there's a global um, decline in growth? Global growth slows, China slows, et cetera, in a way that's outside of what we want. With geopolitical tensions, which is how I would define them, we've had a series of geopolitical tensions. We first had the war in Ukraine that was but had, was, had still persist. And then we had the uh, war in Gaza and Israel, and now it's been escalated to some extent by the recent involvement of, of other countries, or Iran in particular. So all of that creates geopolitical tension. And then we, were, we ask ourselves two questions regularly, which is, what is the impact directly on the US economy? And what's the impact on how people think about the economy, right? Because you can have a direct impact or an indirect impact on the numbers, but you can also have a uncertainty impact. And we already have a lot of uncertainty in the economy about how it's going to go. And so if people become worried about geopolitical tensions that spill over, that can increase uncertainty. So we absolutely do these things. I mean, I'll tell you the models, as any economist in the room will tell you, the models are not very sophisticated at imagining the shocks of these things. And so you have to basically say, it's your model's working, but what if it stops? You know, it's, and then you say, what can we do? So most of it, most of the work that, that I think about is talking through and evaluating what the 
past impacts have been? Why do we think the impacts could be greater or smaller than the past would tell us? And what are the things that we would need to do if that should materialize? So far on the geopolitical tensions, I'll just say that the first and foremost thing is for the people, the first and foremost, our hearts, my heart goes out to the people who are suffering because of this, these conflicts and these wars. This is you know, hard on this, but so far I don't see direct impacts on the US economy um, in, at this level of escalation. Ken, Ken is next. I think Ken had a question. And, and okay, we got Tom. five minutes. Yeah, so we got to go Maybe we can get a couple fast. questions. Yeah, Ken get a couple Tom. questions. Yeah, I'm going to do the speed dating Tom, version. And then we're going to try to uh, speed date. Two, two quick questions. One is a lot of businesses create uh, targets as ranges. Why not create an f- inflation range of two to three percent? And the second question, very quickly, is uh, I listen to Jamie Diamond. They have y- gobs and gobs of data. Do you ever look at how your data compares to some of these major banks with all the data they uh, create? Uh, can we uh, try have? to. Okay, great. And can we try to get Tom's question here? And then I'm going to try to get over here too, but we'll see. You're going to have to help I, me remember. And we've got, yeah. Okay, Tom, right here. Uh, mine's on the, the state of commercial banking in the country and getting your sense of how concerned uh, you are. We've all watched Silicon Valley Bank, uh, you know, get started, uh, excel here, and then fall apart. But the number of small banks that are closing. Uh, as interest rates, as they loaned a lot of money at low interest rates, and now interest rates relatively going through the roof, a lot of closing. How how worried are you about the about that state of affairs and where we're going from here? Let's take a couple minutes on those, and then we're going to try to get a okay couple more questions. on the inflation, changing the inflation target. Uh, not now. I mean, really, there's you know we had a discussion about these things in the framework review, and two percent is a is the target we've chosen. Uh, there's no way in which I would support changing the goalposts while we haven't achieved them. That is, you know, the most important tool we have is our credibility with the public. And if we change the goalposts when we're, we, can, we haven't achieved the goal, um, that will damage credibility, which is not uh, worth it at this point. On the, um, I'm sorry, I forgot the second. Sharing data. Yes, we have a lot. So all the information that you see, we have access to information similar. It's, I mean, it is a really information rich time period that we live in. There's lots and lots of information. The, but information alone is not the answer. You have to have the information, you have to have the analysis, and you have to look forward by hearing what people are actually doing as they go through that. So yes, we have information that's similar to what the large banks have and many other entities that collect it. Uh, commercial banking. On commercial banking, you know the strength of our economy, as many before me have said, and I, Chair Yellen, I mean, uh, Treasury Secretary Yellen, uh, Vice Chair Barr, Chair Powell, um, all of the actors, the strength of our system is, re- is built on the fact that we have banks of various sizes throughout the communities doing different things for different groups. So absolutely, there's a, there's a commitment to continue to, to support those institutions and ensure that they are. We have over 4,500 banks in the country, and only three failed. And the thing I take away from that is that it is a strong and sound um, banking system. There will be um, consolidation, there will be banks that say it'd be better if we were larger, but I haven't seen the full-scale result of of that fear, which I do think is out there, actually materializing. We still have banks of various sizes, and in fact this morning in the, um, or this afternoon it was, in the Latino Action Business Network, I heard that some of their partnerships are with community banks, and they see the strength of community banks because community banks farm, form relationships and are more willing to lend to groups that aren't as well established. So I still think that sector has a, a future. Great. Okay, question from Pitch, and then I'm going to try to get in. I thought uh, I heard you gonna, yeah. use the phrase neutral interest rates early, early on. What, what's the neutral interest rate? Okay, it's an interest rate at which... Um, It's neither restraining nor stimulating the economy. So what is the interest rate when there are no shocks in the economy and everything is just in its equilibrium? So if everything is where it should be, everything's back to normal, inflation's not too high, the labor market has got full employment, and the interest rate is just where it would be some from the foundational factors in the economy, our labor force, our productivity, the things that we're capable of, 
then that would be the neutral interest rate. And it rises and falls with the demand and supply of funds. If, if you've got a lot of funds, a lot of savings available, and not much demand for those savings because nobody's innovating, nobody's borrowing, then the neutral interest rate falls. If you've got a lot of demand for funds and not as much, many funds to be had, then the neutral interest rate rises. Great, okay, so. Neutral interest rate. You must be able to state what that is at some point in time. Oh, what is the number? Not, not the, what is the number right now, but how do you define it? Uh, it and unfortunately, just the way I said, which means that... Yeah, we'll come back. It, we, Let's come uh, back after. Uh, we'll come after. back afterwards. Yeah. I'll talk to you more about so it. Me, but unfortunately, I have yeah. no better answer oh. than that because it's hard. Okay, one more. From, and are, are you a student? You're a student. Okay, good. good. I think so. Yeah, yeah. Okay, we'll get... So Kevin and then the student. Great. You got to get a student in here, Kevin. Well, thanks a lot. You know, as as we've calmed down the overall economy, healthcare stood out as one area of high inflation, and because of insurance, it seems like it wouldn't be sensitive at all to interest rates. Like, how are you looking at healthcare as a, a driver and thinking about whether you know if we, we're going to collapse the economy just so the healthcare uh, okay. costs come down? Great. Okay. Thanks for that. And then the student questions. Yeah. Hello, President Mary. Uh, thank you so much for being here today and for sharing so your thoughts. Um, I've read that you focus a lot of your work on um, the gap between employment and wages between the f different demographic groups, and that brings me to my question in the future. How will you keep addressing those income inequalities and economic uh, inclusivity, especially with the technological displacement from AI? Okay, Great. thank you. Okay, so healthcare. So healthcare is a interest rate in sensitive sector generally and so it's a sector that is not not going to respond that much to our movement of interest rates one of the things we see is that a good portion of the jobs is more a disproportionate portion of the jobs being created right now are being created in healthcare because we have a lot of needs for healthcare as the population ages how we solve that financing problem is something that our fiscal agents have to think about because mm -hmm. it is not something that the Fed can do. It doesn't even respond to our interest rate policies, but it's definitely something, you know, Mark asked me about the, the big problems that fiscal agents, like the debt and the deficit, I think another one, and we've both studied over our career, the entitlement programs and the, the government programs, and, and healthcare is one of those things that we will ultimately have to wrestle with, but again, that will be the fiscal agents, uh, not, not the Fed on that. On the question of um, the gaps, you referenced my research, and I have done research on this with many co-authors in, the, in, the, in my profession, but essentially what we've found over time, and this is how I'll end it, is that I, again, I work at the Fed, and so I have one lever, the, the interest rate to create the conditions of a sustainable economic growth path with full employment and price stability. The, the good aspect of that that I keep coming back to is that a long and a durable expansion is the thing that you see closing those gaps. So if you looked at any gaps in the economy, they often and almost always close as the economy's expansion continues because more people get opportunities. And so it's one of the reasons that I've repeated so many times, our goal right now is to restore price stability as gently as we can. Because the number one problem with the gaps is they rise in recessions. And so the, the fact that we can avoid a recession if we, if we work to do that and we bring inflation down, that would be the best way that the Fed, in my judgment, can contribute to those long-term goals. Amazing. Thank you so much. Give it up for President Mary Daly. Thank you. And we'll hope to see you in a few weeks for our next event with the first Deputy Managing Director of the IMF.